now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to the Dr. Cog work session for Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. This is Vice Chair Steve Conklin, Chair of the work session. And with that, we will begin with any public comment. Linda, do we have anyone that wants to make a public comment this evening? Uh, at the moment, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, we'll give it just a moment. If you do wish to make public comment, go ahead and raise your hand so you can be recognized. Otherwise, we will move ahead with the agenda. Okay. Well, we will move ahead then. Thank oh, you, very Mr. Much. Chair. I'm so sorry. It looks like we did have someone raise their hand. Um, it looks like, uh, unfortunately, I don't know the actual name of the individual, but Hartkey Designs Zoom Two. <laughs> um, I can go ahead and allow them to speak if you're ready, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. And public comment limited to three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, you are unmuted, and you may speak. Hi, uh, it's Stephanie Walton. I was just raising my hand to, to oh. move over <laughs> as a panelist. <laughs> but thank you Stephanie. for the, you're all doing a great job. That's my public comment. <laughs> Sorry, awesome. I get, I'll I must be logged in on my work account. <laughs> no <laughs> worries, you. we'll get you moved over. Thanks. All right, and with that, uh, I do not see anyone else for public comment. Okay, well, we will then uh, proceed with the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. And... Uh, Well, if you can go ahead, there we go. Uh, we will proceed uh, in your packet is a summary of the July 6, 2022 board work session uh, information just for your information. That's attachment A. And with that, we will go ahead and move into uh, the 2025 Regional Transportation Plan, the 2050 RTP, Greenhouse Gas Analysis Update, which our staff has been doing just amazing work with, uh, the draft document overview and adoption schedule, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, let me bring up the presentation. Thank you for your kind words. Give me just a moment here. I will say after Jacob's presentation, before we adjourn, we'll have a couple of announcements and you probably wanna hear these announcements when they come up. So stick around for the rest of the meeting. Sorry, give me just a, just a moment. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. Hopefully you all are seeing this now in presentation mode. We can see it in presentation mode, you're good. Great, thank you very much. All right, so um, wanted to give you um, one more update. Uh, we are actually, there is light at the end of this tunnel. We are getting really close. Um, so wanted to kind of, you know, give you an overview of where we're at um, and really start thinking forward to what this is gonna look like when we get to adoption and talk about our 30 day public comment period. Um, so first, I think you all have seen this slide before. I'm not going to go through it again. This is just kind of the visual reminder of all the things we have been talking about over the past six months or so from a technical perspective, um, the thematic sort of strategies um, that we've been analyzing and using in terms of revising the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to meet um, the greenhouse gas um, uh, emission reduction levels. Um, and you've seen a version of this table before as well. So again, this is sort of review, um, but just, you know, again, a synopsis of sort of where we started, um, you know, the modeling work that we've done, the everything, all the strategies and everything that we've been working on together over the last six months. Um, you can see that in the top row, a reminder of this table using the rules format of measurement of million metric tons, uh, which is why you're seeing decimals, but these are actually large numbers. Um, of greenhouse gas emissions and emission reductions. So the top row is again, um, everything that we've been working on, all the strategies, um, when we model those for the region in the plan, um, you can see the, I think, pretty significant, meaningful uh, reduction levels that we get from that work. One thing that we've been working on um, in the second row is sort of things off model, but that are directly related to our plan in terms of additional programmatic investments. 
Uh, we've been trying to calculate those and the emission reductions from those and including those in the analysis as well. We've spent a lot of time talking about the mitigation action plan, uh, the proposed measures and the, and the associated emission reduction um, estimates from those, that's the third row. When you add all of those together uh, to the fourth row, the bold black, the total GHG reductions, um, again, million metric tons, but still large amounts of reductions based on all of those strategies. And you compare those with the bold red, which is um, again for review, the reduction levels by analysis here that are specified for the Dr. Cog region directly in the greenhouse gas planning standard rule. These are the levels or the targets that we're trying to meet. So if you compare the bold black with the bold red, you can see that indeed, based on our framework of strategies that we've been working on together, uh, we do believe that we will meet the emission reduction levels for each analysis here, and we will comply with the rule. So that's the good news. Um, so what does that look like in terms of the plan? You know, really what we're doing here at the end of the day is we're revising our 2050 regional transportation plan. So I wanted to show that to you in context. When we prepared and adopted the original sort of 2050 regional transportation plan, we adopted that plan back in April of 2021. Um, and that plan included the actual plan document itself. There's four chapters to the plan. And then there's a lot of you know, supplemental technical information, a lot of federal requirements, a lot of additional things that we include, our air quality conformity documents. All of those are in appendices to the plan. Uh, so appendices A through S. So if you look on our website today, that's what you'll see is you'll see the adopted plan as a document and then appendices A through F, or excuse me, A through S um, listed as part of the ecosystem of the 2050 plan. For this 2022 update for the greenhouse gas work that we're doing, um, wanted to kind of summarize the changes from that plan perspective. What's changing as part of the plan? We have made some routine updates to the plan document itself. Uh, we've updated tables, um, text, maps associated primarily with the project changes that we've talked about in previous meetings, the cycle amendments that we did to process changes to uh, requested project-based amendments, um, some updates to other language in the plan relating to this work effort. Um, we've made some routine and minor updates to a few appendices, some were really minor. In the transit appendix, for example, just about all we changed was the reference to the University of Colorado A-Line um, because it's no longer called that, so we wanted to reflect that. Um, some other appendices like the financial plan, we made some updates that correspond to the changes that we've made as part of the overall analysis. We have made some significant updates to the air quality conformity documents. Um, that's a federal requirement anytime we update the plan. We also do our, our regular air quality conformity analysis. Uh, we have updated those appendices based on um, all the work that we've done over the last six months. And then we've got some new things that are required of us by the rule and that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the greenhouse gas transportation report. This is a document that essentially I have slides on it, but essentially it documents the analysis that we did and our strategies to comply with the greenhouse gas planning standard. And then we've spent a lot of time already talking about the mitigation action plan, which is of course a new document required of us by uh, the greenhouse gas planning standard. Both of those documents were sent to you Monday afternoon. I uh, wanted to give you a couple of days with them. I, I realized that they're, they're actually not super lengthy documents, but I realized they're very dense technically. Um, they are drafts. We're continuing to sort of finalize them for the public comment period, but we wanted to show you at least the draft work in progress documents so you'd have a visual understanding of what these things are actually starting to look like. So I want to talk about the GHG, excuse me, the Greenhouse Gas, let's try not to use acronyms, Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Um, as I've said, it's a new report that's required by the GHG rule, so I use an acronym. Um, it documents our analysis and our proposed strategies for compliance with the greenhouse gas planning standard. It contains our emission analysis for the adopted 2050 regional transportation plan, because remember the rule defines that as our baseline that we're starting from for this analysis and for our proposed updated plan. So it basically shows you um, what I showed you in the table a couple slides ago and it explains kind of the steps that, that we did to get there. It documents those specific strategies in the plan changes to meet the reduction levels that are required by the rule. And it includes the mitigation action plan. So per the rule, it's a little bit confusing. The mitigation action plan actually becomes an appendix of the greenhouse gas transportation report. And then it also, the greenhouse gas transportation report also contains other appendices um, that are required of us that document our focused travel model, um, the EPA moves model, which is the motor vehicle emissions model um, that we use for air quality conformity analysis and for greenhouse gas analysis. Um, we also created an appendix that documents 
um, the public and stakeholder engagement that we've done during this 2022 update um, that we will do during the upcoming public comment period um, and a few other related topics associated with um, the greenhouse gas work that we've done. So I realize, um, again, there's a lot of information in the greenhouse gas report and in the appendices, so I want to just break it out for you a little bit. Um, again, it starts with the purpose and the background, Dr. Cog's role in all of this, our planning framework, our planning documents, just to kind of lay that foundation for this work. Um, it talks about our tools to model greenhouse gas emissions, talks a lot about our focused transportation model, um, our land use forecasting, our uh, the, the EPA moves model that I referenced, um, the tools that we're using to do this work and how, you know, in summary form, how they work and how we're using them to do this. Um, so actually there they are, the focused transportation model, our urban sim household and jobs model that we use in our land use forecasts and our growth and development forecasts, the EPA moves emissions model, and then the process of modeling greenhouse gas emissions. How did we actually do it? Um, you know, peeking inside that black box and understanding for transparency how we did the technical work on this. So how we set the baseline, which again is defined for us in the rule, the plan as adopted at the time back in 2021 and the plan as modeled when it was adopted in 2021. Um, our program and uh, our project, sorry, that should say project and program investment changes to the 2050 regional transportation plan that we did um, through this analysis to help us comply with, um, with the rule. Um, the programmatic funding element that I touched on a couple slides ago, um, talking about that and the analysis related to that, um, again, is one of the strategies to help us demonstrate compliance. And then updates reflecting the observed housing data. And we've talked about that a couple meetings ago um, in terms of our land use forecasts and truing them up to observe data um, on the ground over the last three to five years. And then also obviously the emissions results associated with all of that work. Um, and then the next section, we talk about additional programmatic investments, these off-model calculations um, that I referenced a couple of slides ago, the additional investments that we want to make in the plan, um, the non-project specific programmatic types of investments. So we talk about those specifically in the plan and how we're using, how we're using them to help um, get us to compliance. Uh, we've identified, I believe, four strategies, signal timing, that we would do signal timing, additional signal timing work above and beyond what's already included in all of these um, additional programmatic investment. We already have all of these things in the plan. As part of this analysis, we've identified additional things that we would do to help us demonstrate compliance over the life of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So the additional signal timing work that we would do. Um, CDOT, um, as part of their work on their, um, uh, their compliance with the greenhouse gas rule, um, they have been looking strongly at expanding their bus staying service throughout the state. Obviously, some of that would occur within the Dr. Cog MPO area. So they offered that to us as sort of that partial credit that would occur within our geographic area that we could include that um, in our uh, greenhouse gas transportation report, sort of that fractional work um, to help us demonstrate compliance. Um, additional bicycle pedestrian facilities, if we're able to make additional investment in the plan, you know, what additional bicycle pedestrian facilities and infrastructure could we construct as a region together over the next 30 years and the reductions associated with that. And then complete street retrofits as well. As, um, as you all know, um, the board adopted our complete streets toolkit back last October. Uh, we've been working to implement that. Um, there's things in the federal infrastructure bill um, that we've been working on related to complete streets work. Many of you in your jurisdictions have done complete streets work. So this has been an important focus for this region. And so this is one of the, uh, one of the investments that you know, we look at and analyze if, if we did additional complete streets retrofits together as a region over time, as part of our additional programmatic investment, um, that would help as well in terms of greenhouse gas compliance. So all of these are talked about in the greenhouse gas transportation report and our calculations associated with them. As I mentioned, the report has several appendices, uh, the mitigation action plan, which we've talked at length about, public and stakeholder engagement, which I mentioned, we wanted to document what we've done and what we're doing specifically in this update. And I have a slide on that coming up. Um, key model outputs, um, and I believe that's the appendix that we also included that we sent out to you on Monday, um, and you've seen some of that information before as well. We want people to understand, we want to be transparent in our work around uh, what we did in the model and, and how, how we use the model in this analysis. Um, so the, both the key model outputs and then documentation related to, um, related to the focus model work and related to representing programmatic investments in um, in, our, in our focus model, because that was an initial big piece of our analysis when we started doing this work. 
Um, and then documentation on the EPA moves model, how we're using that in terms of the emissions estimates and, and the emissions analysis as part of this work as well. Um, and then finally, oh, maybe this was the appendix we sent out, the methodology to represent programmatic funding. Um, again, because that was such an important piece, you know, we've talked about this in previous meetings, the significant investment, even in our already in our adopted plan that wasn't initially included in our modeling. We wanted to be very transparent about um, how we've included those investments in our modeling environment and in our technical analysis. Um, and then finally, we've been working on an intergovernmental agreement um, between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment related to the emissions analysis, and that will be included as well. Um, just in terms of our schedule, you've seen this before, but just kind of an updated schedule. Our public comment period will start on Sunday, August 7th. We will publish a legal notice in the Denver Post on, on that date, and that will legally start our 30-day public comment period. It will actually be 31 days of public comment. We will end on the end of the day, September 6th. In the beginning of August um, next week, we will submit um, our GHG transportation report and the mitigation action plan to the Transportation Commission. Um, that is a requirement um, in the greenhouse gas planning standard that we do that. The Transportation Commission has 30 days to review our work associated with that um, and we'll present to the commission in September. We will have, we will also, by the way, um, present our technical work, we will convey our technical work to the Air Pollution Control Division of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, they need to see that within 45 days of adoption of the revised plan, um, so we will do that later this week as well. Um, we will have our public hearing in front of what normally is our board work session in September. Um, we're going to make it a special Dr. Cog board meeting um, and have our public hearing in front, of, um, in front of you all as the board. That'll be a virtual uh, public meeting or public hearing, I should say, at 4 p.m on September 7th. Um, September 14th and 15th, we'll present to the Transportation Commission as required in the rule. September 19th and 20th, our committees, our Transportation Advisory Committee and our Regional Transportation Committee will act on the revised plan and these associated documents. And then you all as the board on September 21st, uh, we hope we'll take action on the revised 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, the Mitigation Action Plan, which is included within it, in the air quality conformity documents representing together our revised 2050 plan that complies with the rule requirements so that we can meet our October 1st deadline within the rule. Um, and then finally, we've talked a lot together. You've heard a lot from me on technical analysis over the last six months. I don't wanna give short shrift to the public and stakeholder engagement work that we've been doing and that we will do as part of this process um, because that's very critically important. So as we've been doing the technical work from about the last six months, January through July, of course, we've been giving a lot of updates to our Dr. Cog committees, um, to you all as the board, um, to our county transportation forms we've presented multiple times. We've had significant stakeholder coordination. Um, folks have asked us to come present. Folks have reached out to us with questions. Uh, we've had a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of group presentations. Um, again, trying to get the word out there, trying to update people on the work that we're doing, trying to be transparent in our technical analysis as we've gone through it. Um, we also, um, as I've mentioned to you a couple meetings ago, reformed our civic advisory group. This is a group that we started with the original 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it's a group of folks that represent either folks directly or, or folks who work with those who are um, part of our vulnerable populations, um, whether that's um, folks who are minorities or low income, um, you know, veterans, uh, people with disabilities, you know, we want to hear those voices. We want those folks to be represented in our transportation planning process. We have met with the civic advisory group approximately every four to six weeks over the last six months um, to get their input and, and get their involvement as we've done this work. Um, as I've said, the public comment period, uh, review period, public comment review period, August 7th through September 6th, here's what we have planned. Um, during this month and during that, during those 31 days, we will be hosting the revised plan and these documents on our social pinpoint engagement site, so people can interact with the documents. We'll have an idea board. Um, they can leave comments. Um, you know, really sort of engage with these documents. Uh, we will do, do. We will do, of course, our traditional e-blast, our social media, um, the things that we do to kind of promote um, these documents and promote the public comment period. We have a planned series of open houses. Um, I believe about four to six open houses um, over the 31 day public comment period. These will be virtual open houses that folks can um, come engage with us and, and answer questions and comment on the plan documents. Um, we will also meet again with our civic advisory group during the public comment period. 
And uh, we have a few presentations. Folks have already asked us to come, probably have some more during the 31 days, um, but we'll be making presentations as requested uh, to anyone who wants to hear from us about, uh, about this work and about the draft plan documents. And then as part of some of this work, particularly with our virtual open houses and with the public hearing, um, we are piloting, piloting some Spanish and American Sign Language interpretation. We wanna start institutionalizing some of that as part of um, the work that we do and as part of accessibility um, to our work so that people can come engage with us. We will also be posting a um, Spanish um, executive summary translation, um, executive summary of the greenhouse gas transportation report um, so that folks can have that in both English and Spanish as well. So that's all I have, wanted to give you that update and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And with that, we will uh, open it up for questions. If you have a question, raise your virtual hand, please. Uh, Mr. Baker. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Hey. One of the questions that I wanted to ask is, we went through a very long process to institute the dual funding model. And when Dr. Cog is, got earmarked about $900 million to go to bus rapid transit over the next 10 years, will that amount or any of these uh, changes Will that change our dual funding model? Will we have to uh, rethink that that twenty percent regional and eighty percent sub regional share? Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Baker. That's a good question. Let me start an answer and invite Ron to supplement as needed. The short answer to your question is no. It does not change the dual funding model. It doesn't change that mechanism for how we'll do the tip calls. Um, it will change over time. You know, the $900 million you're referring to is based on the project changes and the financial plan, financial plan changes in the 2050 RTP. We are trying to sort of free up or reallocate an additional $900 million in the programmatic investments over time to help us demonstrate compliance with the rule. So if we're going to do those things right, we have to mean it. Those are things that we're actually going to invest in over time um, in those programmatic investments. So some of that may come through eventually in TIP calls over time, but it won't change the structure of the dual model TIP process, if that's your question. Yeah, I, I, I just can't. I see him, some linkage going on there between TIP and this plan. So thank you for your answer, Jacob. Thank you, Director Baker. Other questions? Comments, thoughts, poems, stories. Rumor, gossip, innuendo. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, Jacob, you may have just done a, a fantastic job. Mr. Rex. Well, we know you did a fantastic job, but you may have answered all the questions. Mr. Right. Rex. No, thank you, sir, very much. And I thought I'd just take a moment to in case people are whittling and thinking about questions to ask, um, that, uh, you know, this is not the last shot they're going to get at this, of course, right? Um, this, you know, this, the, the documents that staff has prepared in part is the documentation that we'll share with uh, through our, our public comment period. And it's been a monumental effort. And I know you all know that if anybody who's, who's been involved with the creation of a plan knows how much time and effort it takes. Um, especially when, you know, you're kind of building the plane as you fly, but, uh, but so thank you staff very much. Um, but I, but I did want you to feel like, you know, if you, if you still have time to obviously review those documents, um, as we get them all posted up and, and, uh, and all that kind of good stuff and, and we can have more conversation at the September meeting. So just, just kind of FYI on that. Um, I, we thank you for your dialogue and discussion as we've gone over the past, I don't know how many meetings we've brought this to your attention, but it's, uh, it's a lot. And um, so thank you also very much for, for all the conversations we've had. Um, I think we're in a pretty good spot. We feel pretty comfortable with uh, the proposed strategy going forth. And um, recognizing that, you know, I know there is some angst, right, associated with some of these measures, but, but please understand that, um, you know, we're here as a resource to help in, um, you know, uh, 
any information or staff support that you may need to explore some of these th some of these uh, strategies. We're we're here to help. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I'll just leave it there. But thank you also very much, Director Maurer. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's a lot of work been done here, and um, yeah, as I, I've read through, you know, I'll come up with a question. I'll look through the document. Got to know. And if I lose you, because I'm having a bad internet day, um, I'll just send my question, you know, into Jacob. But um, when I'm looking, when we were talking about that meeting, we're looking at the table, um, talking about the in the red, and it says that things that we're going to levels uh, that we're needing to meet. Um, I guess my question goes back to, you know, some of the mitigation measures I'm thinking are going to have to be used. And so the one where we're looking at um, a little more density and some of our housing and so forth and next to adjacent to our, uh, you know, our corridors are like light rail corridors and our BRT corridors. So are you expecting some of that's going to happen and that's how we're going to achieve this level? Yeah, Director Mauer, the short answer is yes. Um, that is part of the overall strategy. Again, when it comes to any of the mitigation measures, including the one that you named, what we're trying to do is, you know, again, first we're, we're building on the good work the region's already doing, right? Most of these things are not actually new in the region. You all have been doing a lot of these things for many years. So we're trying to fit within that context and look at what's applicable in the region and what additional work can be done in those areas over time. Um, yes, they are voluntary. I wanna say that again one more time, the mitigation measures are voluntary, um, but yes, part of our overall structure of you know, closing that gap in order to help us meet the reduction levels, but something that again, we'll report on annually and we'll adjust as we go. Um, you know, we've got eight years until we need um, to use those mitigation measures to help demonstrate compliance with our 2030 analysis year. So we've got time to, to work together as a region to understand what's being done, what more can be done, uh, what works for folks and, and being able to report on that and implement that over time. Oh, okay, good, Jacob. Thank you very much. And a lot, of, that was great work, which you all did on this. So thanks. Thank you, Director Maurer. Director Adoricio. Thank you very much. I think the, the, this is a good line of questions. And I just hope that as we move forward together that we support those communities that don't have all those transit corridors, that don't have BRT and they have not had their uh, rail lines finished out. So if we're gonna work on this stuff together as a, as a Denver region, I just would ask that the folks down South support our efforts to get those uh, projects up North finished that were promised by RTD, that we look at equity and geography, geographic equity um, and, and look at this as a lens of all, all of us trying to work together on this stuff. So I appreciate where we're going with this. Um, and I love the mitigation measures, having an opportunity to do it, but in order for everyone to have access to some of these uh, benefits, we all kind of need to pull together and make sure we're supporting uh, the implementation and the construction of infrastructure so everyone has an opportunity to use those mitigation measures. Did we lose Chair Conklin? He looks frozen on his screen. Well, well, if it pleases oh, the group. There we go. There oh, we there go. you go. Okay. God bless my internet connection. I didn't know I was having that problem too. Uh, apologies. Uh, you just all suddenly froze. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you so much. And, and really to, um, to, to echo, I think, some of Director Maurer's concerns, um, I actually worked with our community um, development division to, to just get an idea of what it takes to get to certain densities and what that looks like. So we went to, you know, a couple of uh, existing businesses in Lone Tree that it, in the South you're probably familiar with. And and uh, in terms of businesses, Charles Schwab, with a lot of still undeveloped acreage, comes in at 133 employees per um, uh, acre. Um, uh, nationwide insurance, which is in less of a campus and more of a traditional office complex, 
is 416 per acre. Um, uh, again, they're very close to the light rail. Uh, I looked at some row homes um, that are lovely, large enough to raise a, a family near parks and open space. Uh, they came in at 16 um, uh, units per acre and some uh, more uh, dense apartments um, near a coffee shop called the Monk and Mongoose that many of you may be familiar with um, at 75 units per acre in the building. So without really trying to um, feel uncomfortably dense, um, I think that some of these changes will naturally happen and the density will occur. And uh, to Steve's point, we want to try and support um, what's happening with our space uh, on behalf of the entire metro area. So those of us that have space to develop along the light rails and BRT corridors, um, it, it's not going to be hard. It's not going to be ugly or overly congested. It can be lovely and also efficient. Thanks. Thank you, Director Schott. I'll note in the chat, a uh, fair number of folks commenting, supporting Dr. Director Odoricio's comments. So thank you for that. Uh, Director uh, Kraft Tharp. Thank you. So yes, I want to support his comments also and invite you all to take a ride on the Northwest Rail. Oh, we don't have the Northwest Rail. So uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, Doug, I'm wondering if you might want to make a comment about the conversation we had yesterday. Maybe you kind of like to recap some of that. Yes, yes, ma'am, I would do. I had the pleasure of uh, speaking with the commissioner yesterday. A pleasure. Right, and um, we had a good conversation about about the uh, about the proposed rule and our and our amendment changes. And you know, again, I mean, I know you know there's there's. You know, some angst when we always have the conversations about this, about, you know, I know this is a big local control state, right? And we we get that with as it relates to land use. And the conversation that that uh, Commissioner Sharp and I are uh, sharp, Commissioner Kraft Tharp and I had. Although I was, love Commissioner Sharp. Indeed, indeed. That um uh was that uh, you know, densification in the suburbs is not you know, is not exactly the same as what it might be in the urban core, right? And that's fine. And I think that gets to the point that Director Shaw was making, right, with regards to, you know, what that might look like. Um, and that is the type of development that we're hoping that we can take credit as a region, right, as we, as we begin, um, you know, over the next, you know, between now and 2050, we're expecting to grow by, you know, almost another million people. So we, you know, part of our analysis in the region we brought forth the, the, the strategies that we have is that we just feel there is, um, you know, that this type of development will occur naturally within our region. And, um, and I also want to point out that I always think about uh, Director Teal in this situation because the, of the, the analogy that he always uses about what Dr. Cog should be and sh maybe should not be. And it, we're, you know, Dr. Cog is not the police station, right? We're the library, we're the university. We're here to provide a resource to you all um, in hope that, um, you know, an aggregate and the synergy that's created by this collaborative that we can get ultimately where we wanna be, right? That create and continue to have a positive message. And we really do believe there's opportunity here for us to have some legitimate conversations and, uh, and help each other, right, get to where we want to be when we grow up as a region. So, Director Kraft Tharp, I want to thank you so very much for the conversation yesterday. And I see your hand is up again, so I'll, I'll, I'll yield. So, if I could just add on to that conversation, can I just do that, Mr. Chair? So, the other part of that conversation was some of what um, came up at some of the past meetings here. And that was my question around um, land use restrictions. Dr. Cog gives money on one hand. On the other hand, they're doing these regulations. Um, so is, is that going to be tied together? That um, will future monies for different sources only be given to those that are participating? Land use is one of the few things, and I've only been a local guy for, uh, what, a year and a half now. But I know this really, uh, really well, 
land use is one of the few things that we are able to do. This is important to um, serving our community. And um, I myself would be very reluctant to give up our land use um, authority to Dr. Cog. Love the climate, love, believe that we need to reduce greenhouse gases, but um, we are in charge of our land use decisions. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Well, first of all, we don't want it, um, <laughs> as you know, but also, um, no, it, it, it's, it's a very good point, legitimate conversation, right? And I think, you know, listen, we feel we have no, ex I, let, me, let me say this, Dr. Cogstaff obviously doesn't make that decision, right, with regards to what is used in, in the allocation, right, of, of TIP monies, right, with regards to the criteria. That's a board decision. But uh, from a staff perspective, uh, Director, um, at, you know, and you know this based on a conversation we had yesterday, we have no expectation that that will be the case. Um, and I get back to the police police department versus the, the library concept. I think, you know, our hope is that the conversations that we have as a regional community is good enough to get us to where we need to be. And I, we really do think it is. We think the measures that we've laid forth are ones that are achievable um, and will occur over the next eight years or be, and beyond. So I hope I hope I addressed it. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Levy. Thanks and um, yep, it's still a good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, this is always a really good and rich discussion. I really appreciate it. And I think I learn something new every single time we look at all of these. And, and uh, Jacob, uh, you've been doing phenomenal work to, uh, to do this analysis and get us ready to make, um, to adopt these plans within our deadline. I, I, I'm wondering, you know, I think, I think parts are starting to come together for me that weren't coming together for me very well before. And I really appreciate what uh, Director Shaw um, sort of shared with all of us about um, how you know different different developments and land use configurations actually can um, start to move towards what the proposals are in the mitigation action plan, and that and that they would be welcome in all of our communities. What I'm just kind of wondering about is um, Dr. Cog staff has done a lot of analysis on these transportation nodes and the areas within a quarter mile and a half mile and all the potential that there is there for greenhouse gas reductions. And with all that wonderful mapping and analysis that you've done, um, how do all the local governments that are represented, represented on the screen who want to keep their local land use control, we do too, um, and no one's proposing to take it away. Uh, we'll fight that if it if it were to happen, just like everybody else here would. But how how do the two get married? Um, how can uh, the communities here, um, if they're revisiting their comprehensive plans, if they're considering a rezoning, um, you know, how can they take advantage of all this analysis and mapping work that you've done so that so that they see, oh, there's an opportunity here that this isn't the way we had done our land use planning in the past. We hadn't looked at this as a potential for densification or, or reducing parking requirements, which by the way, benefits developers because it's very expensive to build structured parking and it takes land out of uh, development. But you know, how does that actually come together? That's what I'm really wondering about because I think that's been the missing piece for me where I see this is how we're gonna close that gap in greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, and the way we're gonna close, and, and you know, we've got all those plans, but you know, every meeting we hear the same thing, um, don't tell us what to do. You know, I'd, I'd love to see you know, that, that the folks here say, wow, we love it that you've done this, this modeling for us. We're gonna take that and incorporate that into our comprehensive planning process. Yeah, Director Levy, if I may, that's a really good question. Let me try to respond to it. First, appreciate your kind words and just, you know, the initial thing you said, this is a really complex rule and it's a really complex process. So, and this is the first time that we've all collectively gone through this together. So, you know, we're trying to make the pieces fit together, but it's been a struggle for everyone. And hopefully you all feel like it's starting to come together. But in regards to your question specifically, we recognize that 
related to the mitigation action plan, I think there's a couple specific things. One is that since the rule you know, says if we adopt a mitigation action plan, we do need to do annual reporting, you know, we, we will need to work with all of you. And we talk about this in the mitigation action plan to come up with reporting mechanisms, to come up with tracking mechanisms uh, for the data, for the actions, for the things that you want to do, that you choose to do, that we can collect up, roll up regionally and, and use that as part of our reporting. So that's one sort of thing that we're gonna spearhead. Um, I'll take Commissioner Teal's uh, sort of analogy of the police station and library and turn it into the research center. Because the other thing that we want to do is to provide support, provide information, data, resources, um, any other supports that we can provide to jurisdictions who are interested, if you choose to do so, if you want to explore a particular mitigation measure, or a particular you know, area in your community, anything that you're interested in, we want to be there as staff to kind of support you, to help you think through and kind of figure out, hey, I might be interested in ABC, how, how could that work in my community? We want to be there to kind of work through that. Um, sort of, you know, um, tailored analysis with you um, to the extent that you're interested and want to do that. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Levy? It, it does. Um, I wish you would just stay in one place on my screen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, no, it, it does to a large extent. I, I wonder whether there's an opportunity to be maybe a little more proactive here. And I'm thinking about something I know uh, Director Kraft Tharp knows well when uh, I believe probably when when Egypt when we um, took office in the uh, in the state house um, we got I know I got from Dr. Cog I got a whole little demographic packet um, all about my house district um, age racial composition income all kinds of really incredibly helpful information and I wonder whether maybe some of these maps and analysis could be broken down on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. And, and you say to, to Boulder County, well, we've noticed that you, you have this transit node here and here are the opportunities within a quarter mile and a half mile and here's some vacant land and here's some things you might be able to do. You know, not in a, any sort of, you know, just a, you know, informational uh, phrase because it is, yeah. you know, it's all here for me. The way I organize all my information, I'm very compartmentalized. Uh, this is Dr. Cog information, and when I go and talk to my my planning people, um, um, I'm, I, I'm not as good as Director Shaw. I don't take all that stuff and go say, "Okay, tell me what we can do." Yeah, no, I think just to respond briefly, Commissioner Levy, you're you're exactly right, and I think that's exactly what we're intending. You know, we have a great sort of data and mapping and resource capabilities within our staff at Dr. Cog. And if a community came to us and said, hey, you know, map half mile within rail stations or map this geography or help us with this, you know, analysis of this particular area or this particular type of data, we would love to do that um, for that community if they're interested. Um, I will put in a quick plug, by the way, that not quite to this sort of conversation, but just so you all know, we do have general um, community profiles for each of our Dr. Cog member communities on our website. Not quite for this analysis, we'd want to take it to the next level, but just so you all know uh, what you were referring to, Commissioner Levy, we actually do have those community profiles um, on our website. Great. Thank you. Uh, Director, or Do Mr. Papstorf. Thank you, Chair Conklin. I just I did want to supplement a, a little bit and just um, inform uh, the board that you know we have we have started to incorporate some of this support work into our unified planning work program. We're trying to institutionalize some of this work that will support um, our local government members and then and supports this work over time. And we'll begin uh, later this year, beginning of next year, the development of our next unified planning work program. And our intent is to build on this work and kind of add additional work elements in our work program for us to help you um, implement these things where they make sense. And, and getting to Director Levy's point, that's providing information, that's support, that's best practices, that's that's showing examples of where things are working and how they're working in, in other jurisdictions in the region, just as sort of good examples, uh, right? So a lot of, lot of that work, Director Levy, that I think you're getting at are things that we're intending to do. Uh, to support that work. Um, I, I will also say that when you all adopted the policy for the 2024 through 2027 TIP, um, we do have set-aside programs identified in the, in the TIP where we allocate TIP money out to 
kind of help with some of these local planning efforts and help local communities. So we're actually putting resources on the table um, to assist local governments that have an interest and an opportunity in these things to pursue support, uh, financial support and planning support uh, with our resources to actually assist in this in these efforts. Great, thank you very much. Other questions, comments? And Mr. Chair, if I may, if there's no other questions, I don't wanna preempt anyone, but I do just wanna take a second to acknowledge the team of staff at Dr. Cog that's been doing this work. Um, I've been actually a very small part of it. Um, it has taken a constellation of folks in multiple divisions, really smart people, um, a real great team of folks to do this analysis and put this work together. And I just wanna acknowledge that team to all of you. No, thank you for that, absolutely true. Uh, you're the face of it and that you've given us the presentations, but that's, that's we very much appreciate you uh, calling out that there are a lot of people involved in that. I, I'm the figurehead as they say. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we are done with that uh, topic on the agenda. Anything else before we close out that portion before some important announcements? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we are up to uh, the point of announcements. Uh, correct, Doug, no other official business on the agenda. Uh, one announcement is the collaboration assessment, which those of you that have served on the board in past years know that comes out once a year. It's a chance for us to get feedback about how we think things are working. Uh, that comes out tomorrow, should come out tomorrow, so it should hit your email box. It is vitally important that we get those in, that we get that feedback. It so helps uh, hearing from everybody, whether you've been on the board one day or you've been on the board since time began. Um, it's just an, an important information. Uh, and if everybody's good and everybody fills it out, we won't have a board meeting this month. How's that sound? That's a fair trade-off. Uh, at this point, it looks like we will probably not have a board meeting uh, later this month. Uh, that could change if something absolutely urgent came up. So I want to have that little asterisk. Uh, but at this point, no board meeting is scheduled at this point. Uh, if you are on a committee, specifically f &B, there will be a virtual f &B committee meeting. Uh, performance of engagement, probably not. But again, if something comes up, that could be, uh, that could change. But I uh, thought, thought we'd give you some good news that uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to have a board meeting this month. We've been doing so much work and, and staff has been doing so much uh, that, that it, it's appropriate to kind of take a little bit of a break on that. Uh, and uh, we'll be very busy in September. And ideally, the thought is that it's September for the board meeting, we will return to in-person. The, the special meeting will be virtual, but that's the plan. Doug, any additions to that? No, sir, that was perfect. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Uh, with that, any general announcements? Anything for the good of the order? Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a great night and we'll see you soon. Take care. Safe, Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.